going to invite you that you would open your Bible uh, with me tonight to the book of Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. And if you've been with us the last few weeks, we're taking our time through the life of Joseph, really learning what the Lord is doing in his life, that God was developing the character of Joseph in three different settings. God was developing the character of Joseph while he was in the pit, mistreated from his brothers, while he was in the palace, there tempted by Potiphar's wife, and also while he was in prison as he was there unjustly put. God, in every circumstance, was developing the character of Joseph. Why was he doing that? Because he was preparing him for the placement of his calling. And how many of us know that God is interested more so in your godliness than he is in your giftedness? I think so many times we think, well, I'm gifted. I should be in that position or that place or that calling or that title or that authority. But God is more interested in your, your godliness than he is in your giftedness. He, he is more interested in your character than he is in your capacity. God first builds the man, and then he uses that man to build the work. He, God first prepares the man for the moment, and then he prepares the moment for the man. That is the providence of God. This is how God works. This is how God oversees and orchestrates the events, not only in Joseph's life, but also in your life, also in our life. We're, we're always in a constant state of preparation. We're always being prepared for what God has for us next. And it's very important that we never waste the place or the season that God has us in because he's only training us up developing our character to use us in the next place of ministry. And what do we see there in Joseph's life? That God is overseeing his life. God is orchestrating every event. That There are no coincidences in the sovereignty of God. How many of us know that? There is nothing by chance. There are no accidents. There are only divine appointments. The way God lines things up, it is by his divine will and for his glory and for the good of his children. So wherever Joseph was, notice what happened. God blessed them there. He may have been forgotten by man, but he was remembered by God. And this here, few chapters that we read, it's about what God is doing in the life of Joseph that God was going to deliver him, that God was going to provide for him, that God was going to protect him. He was learning in a very important lesson, even there in prison, that his deliverance would not come from man, but his deliverance would come from the Lord. In Proverbs 21, verse 31, what does the psalmist say? The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. Our deliverance is not from our human strength or from manpower or from our resources, but it's from God. It's from the Lord. His justice, his vindication would come from God. It would not come from those that he knew. So it's very important as we look at the life of Joseph that we commit our case to God. And there was a very important season in Joseph's life, and he was Confused, maybe he was troubled, he was waiting, but God knew what he was doing. And when you read here the Bible, not only in this chapter, but throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we should read every single page and verse and word from God's perspective. Because when God is rightly in view, everything else comes to focus properly. When God is rightly in view of Scripture, when we are looking for who God is, and what he wants to show us about himself, everything else comes to focus in the right perspective. You know what the chief fo focus of the word of God is? That we would know the God of the word. That we would know it's not about Joseph here, it's about God. In our own life, it, it's not about you, it's about God. <laughs> and sometimes trials remind us that. You know what the trial reminds you? That it, it's not about you. <laughs> That it's not about your plan, it's not about your desire, it's not about your selfishness. Notice what it's about. It's about the Lord. 
So what does the Lord do here? God is the one that gives Pharaoh two dreams. God is the one that reminds the cupbearer about Joseph. God is the one that leads Pharaoh to summon Joseph. God moves then Pharaoh to choose Joseph to be second in command. God helps Joseph forget and forgive. This is all about what God is doing in these events. This is about the hand of God working in the frailty of man, in the the human weakness of who we are. Who is the one that's in charge here? It's God. Who is the one that's making the moves here? It's the Lord. And we are to consistently come to him and say, it is well with my soul. When I consider that God is in control, then we can say, it is well with my soul. Today, if you know that God is in control, you know what you can say? It is well with my soul. It doesn't matter where you are, what battle or trial or situation is before you. If God is in control, that you can say, it is well with my soul. Let's read there, Genesis 41, verse 1. It says, then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the rivers. And suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke, and he slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Let's pray. Lord, we ask right now, God, that as we look into your word, that you would show us, that you would speak for your servants are listening that you would remind us that you're in control of every situation, that that your plans are unfolding right before us, that we have no reason to fear or to be anxious or to be worried that today we would commit ourselves to you where deliverance comes from, that we would put our case in your hands, that we would wait on you, that our eyes would be on you, that our focus would be in the right place. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Together we would say, amen. We begin here by seeing that God gave Pharaoh two dreams. Note that, remember that tonight. God gave Pharaoh two dreams. God was in charge. God was in control. God was orchestrating the events. He he was moving from one event to the other by his divine sovereignty. He was moving Joseph from one place to the next for his own purpose and plan. It was God using Pharaoh. It was God using Joseph. And it says there, then it came to pass. This happened at the end of two full years. Now we have to underline that in our Bibles as students of God's word, because we see here that the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. That Joseph interpreted the baker's dream and the cupbearer's dream. But the cupbearer forgot about Joseph when he was restored to his position. And there Joseph was unjustly in prison. And it took two years for the next event to happen. How many times have we been in a situation or in a place, a season of discouragement or difficulty? And we think two years of waiting. In fact, notice this. Two years of waiting in an unjust situation. And what was the Lord doing during those two years? He was developing him there in prison. He was teaching him maturity. He was saying, Joseph, I want you to learn patience. I want you to learn to wait on me. I want you to trust me. Isn't that the common theme of the Christian life, that God is teaching us to wait on him? That God asks us to wait on him, that he puts us in a situation there, and, and he says, I, I just need you to develop and, 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 until you're ready for what I have for your life. And he'll let us wait in a trial or in a season of tribulation. 
or in a season of, of silence, of waiting on him. And, and sometimes we want those things to be fast. We want to learn patience fast. Isn't that the irony? And we'll say, Lord, teach me patience. And, and the Lord, we, we would ask him, Lord, would you put me in, in the trial, uh, the microwave of trials? And the Lord says, no, let me put you in the crock pot of trials. <laughs> You're just going to sit there and I'm just going to watch you cook. I'm going to wait for you to develop so, so you're ready for what is next. Time will always build character. Time will tell. Time is how we learn patience. What was the Lord doing here in Joseph's life? He was using time to mature him, to make him a man so that he wasn't self-centered, so that he wasn't immature. You have to remember what happened when he was 17 years old. He was gifted, but he was immature still. So there were these seasons in Joseph's life where God had him wait. Yes, this gifted man, this called man, had to wait to learn to depend on God. And it happened that after two full years, now notice the Bible says, it didn't say, Two, two years and a half, or almost two years. No, it, it says it was two complete years. And then he had graduated from that season. And then God was ready to move Joseph to the next place. That after two years that Pharaoh had a dream, notice, and behold, he stood by the river. This is an important dream that we should look at. And suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, these cows. And they fed in the meadows. This was very common as to how cows would graze and eat from the river and the meadows and find their nourishment and supply from there. And then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river. These cows were different. Notice, what does it say? They were ugly. They were gone and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. They, they stood on the opposite side of the bank of the river, and, and these cows were different in that they were not only skinny, but they were ugly as well. And notice what happens, and the ugly gaunt cows ate up, devoured the seven fine-looking cows, so Pharaoh awoke. After that, he woke up. It seems like a strange dream to wake up to, but God had a meaning, God had a message, and he gave Pharaoh a second dream. Notice there in verse 5, he slept and dreamed a second time. And suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump full heads, so Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Notice he woke up and he said, "This I was just dreaming. Have you had a dream and the dream is so bad that when you wake up, you're relieved? That it was just a dream. And sometimes it's not a dream. It seems more like a nightmare. And he realized that this was a dream. Seven heads devoured and swallowed up to seven well-formed heads of grain. And then he woke up. The second dream was only a confirmation of the first dream. This was a message where God wanted to speak. But notice the dream was from God. It's important that you know where the dream was from because he didn't understand the dream, Pharaoh. And no one around him could understand it either. It's, it's like the natural man trying to understand God's word. It, it's impossible. In order to understand the wisdom of God and God's word, notice what you need, the spirit of God. The natural man doesn't understand the things of God. So notice, it goes from a dream to being then distressed. Verse 8, now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. The word troubled means he was perturbed, he was disturbed, he was confused, he was worried, he wanted an interpretation because he didn't know the meaning. That his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men and Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. There was no one who understood what his dream was about. The magicians or the wise men could not in their own human understanding or intellect 
find out what this dream meant, what the meaning of the dream was. He wanted to find out. He knew there was a meaning. And we see this very quickly, how oftentimes man's wisdom is futile, it's weak, it's empty. Before the divine inspired word of God or the voice of God or the message of God, that, that the human understanding without the spirit of God is unable to interpret what God is saying. So notice here in verse 9, what happens? It's God that reminds the cupbearer about Joseph. And it goes from a dream to him being distressed to us finding then direction. Notice verse 9, then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults this day. <laughs> the cupbearer was one that was there next to Pharaoh and he would be guarding that which Pharaoh tasted and drank from. And having close proximity to Pharaoh, he realized, notice, I remember he finally spoke up. After two full years, God said, okay, I'm going to bring to remembrance now to the cupbearer using Pharaoh's dream regarding Joseph. And he says, I remember the day of my failure. He, he was convicted there. He says, I know where my faults are today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, notice he recalls where two years prior, he also was in prison. Him and the baker, and notice what it says, we each had a dream. One night, he and I, two different dreams, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Two separate dreams, two separate interpretations, two different meanings. Now, there was a young Hebrew, notice what he says as he talks about Joseph. Not only was he a Hebrew, because this was a derogatory term to refer to the Jewish people. There was a Hebrew, he was young. And not only he was young, notice that he describes him what he remembers about Joseph after two years. He was a servant. Notice the reputation, notice the remembrance of him. He was young, a Hebrew, a Jewish young boy with us there. He had to be the servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man, he interpreted according to his own dream. This was the character, this was the testimony of Joseph. A servant with divine interpretation from God. A servant who God used. A young servant who was able to receive the meaning of dreams for those that needed interpretation. But there he was, two years waiting on standby. God has us oftentimes wait longer than we would like to. But it happened here according to God's calendar. Did you know that your life, as you've given your life to the Lord, you are not living off your own calendar. We are in God's calendar. We are on God's timetable. We are living according to God's timetable for our lives. We're not late. He's not late. He's always on time. He knows what he's doing. He orders our steps, but he also orders our stops. And sometimes he says, I want you to move forward. And then sometimes he says, I want you to stop right there. But God's hand is in this. And notice what happens. At just the right time, then the butler here knew exactly where to find Joseph. This is the Lord here orchestrating this time frame. And it came to pass, verse 13, notice, just as he interpreted for us, it happened just as he told us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. The credibility, the character, the reputation of Joseph. He gave us interpretation, and it happened just as he said. What was he doing? He was serving. He was faithfully working. He had a reputation whose character was one that reflected of a servant. And notice, God led Pharaoh now to summon Joseph. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. Now, I want you to circle the word quickly. 
Because oftentimes, this is how God works. He, he, he's restored at just the right time, but he's brought out of the dungeon, the word of God says, quickly. After a long period of time of waiting, then suddenly everything moved quickly. Has that not happened in your life before that you're waiting? Maybe one year, two years? And then quickly, every event that God has ordained and orchestrated starts to move forward. <laughs> Just when we think that nothing is happening, God is doing the most important thing. Just when you think that nothing is happening, God is doing the most important thing. He's developing you. He's transforming you from the inside out to be conformed more to the image of Jesus Christ. We all know that verse in Romans 8, 28, and we know all things work together for what? For good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? Well, verse 29 of that chapter tells us his purpose for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. That speaks of purpose. He has a purpose and plan for our lives to be conformed to the image of his son that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. What is his purpose? That we would be transformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Well, what is the waiting for? What is the development for? What is the training for? So that we would be conformed more to be like Jesus. God has us there. God has us waiting so that we would be conformed more to the image of his son. And God here promotes them out of obscurity and everything moves quickly now. Everything is moving forward now. God says it's, it's now the time, appropriate time to go forward to what is next in Joseph's life. And notice what it says there in verse 14, out of the dungeon, and he shaved and changed his clothing and came to Pharaoh. It had been two years he hadn't shaved. He was maybe wearing the same thing. And before he went to Pharaoh, notice he had to shave. He had to change his outer clothing. Why? Because presentation matters. He had an audience with the king. Just imagine if you had an audience with the king, how would you dress for the occasion? You would come dressed in the best attire that you had possible. So he had to shave. It was a sign of disrespect to go in any other way less than that. So he shaves and he changes now. And notice in verse 15, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream. There's no one who could interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that you can understand a dream and interpret it. He says, I I've had a dream and and no one can give me the meaning, but I heard that you can give meaning to dreams. I heard that you're the one that can give me an understanding. It's almost like someone reading the Bible and saying, I don't understand what I read. Would you help me understand what I read? I don't know what it's like, what it means. What does it say? And notice the integrity in, in Joseph's life there in verse 16. This is the response that we should all have regardless of the situation. Because he was mistreated because he was sold twice, because he was falsely accused, because he was forgotten by man. And the first thing that's on his heart, the first thing that comes out of his mouth, it's not to defend himself. It's not to say, well, Pharaoh, just to let you know, first of all, I shouldn't be here in the first place. <laughs> or I want to tell you about Pharaoh's wife who lied, a Potiphar's wife who lied. Or let me tell you about the cupbearer who forgot about me. Well, my brother sold me once, then I was sold again. No, no, he doesn't say that. And he certainly wasn't flattered by Pharaoh's comments about his giftedness to interpret dreams. He wasn't saying, yeah, that's me, the one that interprets dreams. He was not flattered. You know what he was? He was faithful. He was not elated. He was stable. He was not hungry for attention. He, he did not seek for the attention now at this moment. He had a, a moment before Pharaoh, and notice he did not use that moment to promote himself. You know what he used that moment for? To promote the Lord. That's when you know what kind of character you have. When the Lord raised him up, when the Lord gave him a moment before Pharaoh, he used that moment to speak about the Lord. Now, not to speak about himself, not to hype up his gift, 
not to draw attention to himself. Notice what he says there so humbly. And he says this, and Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. (laughs) What a great response. He says, yes, the Lord's done something, but first he wants to say, it's not in me. It's not about me. It's not in me. It's beyond my power. It's not human power. Notice, it's God's power. What what do you see there in verse 16 as you look at Joseph's response? That now he is more humble, now he is more wise than before. Do you remember when he was 17, he told his brothers, hey, I, I had a dream. And all of you guys are bowing down to me. <laughs> and his dad rebukes him. Because he speaks out of immaturity. He speaks out of knowledge. But now he's speaking out of wisdom. You know what true wisdom is? True wisdom always points and gives all glory to God. True wisdom does not seek to showboat to showcase oneself. You know what it wants to do at every moment that it has an opportunity to point other people to the glory of God, not the glory of man. And he says, it's not in me. It's not about me. It's not even about other people. Notice this is, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Notice this confidence. It's not in me, but it's God. God is the one that's going to give you an answer. And notice what kind of answer it's going to be. He's going to give you peace with that answer. When God answers, how many of us know he gives us peace? He gives it because it's coming from God. And he's confident God is the one that's able to answer you. God is the one that's able to provide peace for you. He's pointing Pharaoh to God. Only he can give you the answer of peace. Do you see here that Joseph was not depending upon his gift? He was depending upon the giver of the gift, using every opportunity to bring glory to God. Why? Because he was not hungry for his personal attention. That's the same way that our gifts should be used for, to bring all the attention, all the glory to God and not to self. And notice what takes place there in verse 17 after. It says, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream, I stood on the bank of the river. Here he's going to tell him the dream. This is the observation of what God was showing Pharaoh. I want you to write the word in your Bible there, observation. What did God show Pharaoh? Here, Joseph is observing, is receiving that which God spoke to Pharaoh through a dream. Suddenly, seven cows came up out of the river, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadows. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness as if I've never seen it in all the land of Egypt. These, these cows weren't just ugly. They were the ugliest ones that he had ever seen in Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. Then, when they'd eaten them up, no one would even have known that they had eaten them up, for they were just as ugly as at the beginning, so I awoke. These cows cows were so ugly that after they ate these seven other cows, they were still ugly. No one could tell the difference. (laughs) And notice as it continues there in verse 22, and I saw in my dream, suddenly seven heads came up on the stalk full and good, and then behold, seven heads withered thin and blightened by the east wind sprang up after them. And the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. No one could give me an interpretation. No one can give me an explanation. No one can give me a meaning. I told it to them. You see here that Joseph is receiving the dream. Here's the observation. But after the observation by the Spirit of God, and notice what comes after observation, interpretation. Inter- this is how we should look at God's word. Lord, show me what you have for me. I want to observe. And then, Lord, you through your spirit, give me interpretation. This is how you do Bible study. <laughs> observation and then interpretation comes next. Notice verse 25. Then Joseph said of Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. Though that you had two dreams, they have the same meaning. 
God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. Now, notice here, this is God showing Pharaoh what he's about to do. God is telling you, God is faithful. He, he tells us oftentimes what he's about to do to prepare us so that we would be moved into action, so we would be responsible, so that we would be stewards of what he's given us, so that we would behave in wisdom. So he wants to tell you what he's about to do. God is so fa- If God is faithful enough to speak to an unbeliever, do you not know he wants to speak to you today? He wants to tell you what he's going to do. He's faithful. God is telling you, notice, in advance. <laughs> That's how faithful God is. Oftentimes, he'll speak to us in advance. And then it says, the seven good cows and seven, are, are seven years. And the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. They both represent a period of seven years. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty blighted of, by the east winds are seven years of famine. So they both represented a time, a time of abundance. And then what does he say? A time of famine. A, a time of prosperity. And then seven years of want. You see there in verse 7, first of abundance and then of famine. First, there'll be seven years of abundance, and after those seven years of abundance comes seven years of famine or of want in the land. This thing, which I have spoken to Pharaoh, notice, God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. What I've spoken, what I've given you guidance about, God has shown you what he's about to do. This is the second time, the third time, that Joseph refers to God. It is not me, but God is the one that's going to give you the interpretation. Then God has shown you what he's about to do. Then again, God is showing you this thing because this is what God is about to do. Joseph knew that God was in control and that he was revealing in advance his plan. And he says this in verse 29, Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all of the land of Egypt. Verse 29. But after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. After the seven years of abundance, these seven years of famine will be so severe that the prior seven years would be completely forgotten because of the severity of the famine and the seven years that came afterward. So verse 31, so the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. There is the interpretation. Do you see Joseph receives observation by the Spirit of God? It gives interpretation. You know what happens after observation, interpretation? There you see in verse 32, what do we have then? Application. That's how you study the Bible. You open the Bible, Lord, give me the observation. Write it down in your notebook. Lord, then give me the interpretation. Teach me through your spirit what this says. But then also, not only, do, I don't want to walk away with interpretation. Lord, give me application. How do I use this in my life? What do I do with what you have given me, what you have shown me? So here, in verse 32, he gives him the application of that dream. He says, and the dreams were repeated to Pharaoh twice because this thing is established by God and God will surely bring it to pass. God repeated this two times because this is from God and he will soon make these things happen. So he says this in verse 32. God's going to bring it to pass. So you have to move with urgency. So you have to do something about it. God shows you because he wants to move you into action. I think it's always interesting when people come and, and tell me, you know what, Pastor, I have a really good idea. I think we should really, and you should really do this at church. Or you guys should do this. Always, every time people say you guys, I always, also, I always ask them, who's you guys? There is no you guys at church. And if God is showing you something that you think that needs to be done in his house, you know why he's showing you? Because maybe he wants you to do it. So when someone tells me, I think that you guys should do this, great, God showed you, pray, come up with the plan. He wants to use your life. 
God was showing Pharaoh because he wanted to use Pharaoh. Because he wanted to use Joseph. So he showed them, he gave them the interpretation so that they would prepare for those seven years of famine. This is how God works. He gives us the wisdom so that we can act. No, so, not so that we can say, not so that we can say, we're so smart. There's so many people that are, have head knowledge, but they don't know how to do nothing with it. They maybe are studied, learned, they think that they know a lot, that they can say big words, but they've never done nothing with it. What good is it to have all the knowledge in the head if you've never applied it? You've never used it. Notice what happens here. Verse 33, now therefore let Pharaoh select discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. This is what Pharaoh needs to do now. He, he's applying wisdom to knowledge now. This is from what would happen to what to do with that knowledge in response. We know what's going to happen. So what do we do in response to the knowledge of what we have that's going to happen? Let, let Pharaoh do this. Appoint leaders, supervisors in the land. And notice what he says. To collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. During those seven years, have them gather and collect from the people Notice what he says, one-fifth or 20% of tax of the crops of the land during the seven years of abundance. There is a need. So notice what the leader does. He goes and he tells people the need. He gathers from the people to be a good steward during those seven years of abundance. Verse 35, and let them gather all the foods of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in their cities. This is important here. This is a plan. Here's a goal. You find a, a problem, you find the goal, you see the vision. It had to be formula. There had to be something that they were going to do and steps that they were going to make people to put in the right place of leadership that understood the vision, that took ownership. And not only did they do all those things, but they worked hard to measure the progress and the goal that they had intended in mind. You know what you call this? Wise stewardship. They would not waste the season of abundance. You know what a wise person does? Does not waste during the time of abundance. He knows what to do. Not only knowledge, but also wisdom. Notice that. Then that food shall be as a reserve or a savings for the land, for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. Notice that there'd be enough food for those people to eat during the years of famine. And let this all be done under your authority. Verse 36 tells us that way you have enough to eat during the seven years of want. This is an urgent call to action. God would meet the needs through a man performing the tasks here on earth. You see that? God would meet their needs through a man performing those tasks here on earth. Now, we like to say, and we believe it, and we stay true to it, where God guides, God what? Provides. But that's not an excuse for you to do nothing. You know who God provides through or when God guides? Through who? His people. <laughs> through you, through your generosity, through your hard work, through your sacrifice, through your giving. That's how God provides. It's not a, 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 a saying that we say to excuse ourselves from participation. Here he knows that God is about to provide and God would meet the needs as man would perform the tasks there on earth. Now, God moved Pharaoh to choose Joseph. Verse 37, so the advice, the counsel was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of all his servants. What did they see? That the spirit of God was in him. They recognized that this man was filled with the wisdom and spirit of God and humility. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such as one as this man in whom the spirit of God is? You think about it. He said, who else can we find who has the spirit of God just like him? When they heard him speak, when they heard him give glory to God, 
When they heard him give interpretation, when they heard him give application, notice what they, they deduced from that, what they realized from that. Can we find another man who obviously is filled with God's spirit like this man right here? And this is how he responds there in verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, and as much as God has shown you all of this, there's no one as discerning, notice, understanding, and as wise as you. God has given you the understanding. God has given you the wisdom. God's told you what you should do. Not only has he showed you what would happen, he also told you what we should do. It's God's spirit that gives discernment. It's God's spirit that gives wisdom. Did you know that both of those things are gifts of the spirit? We should ask God, Lord, can you give me discernment? Would you give me wisdom from your spirit so I know what to do in the times of abundance and in the times of want? Because here they recognize Pharaoh saw in the character of Joseph by his wisdom, by his humility, that the spirit of God was in him. See, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit can be seen in your life in a very practical way. You know what ways the Spirit of God can be seen in your life? Very practical ways. Number one, in your character, the Spirit of God will be seen. Number two, in your humility. The Spirit of God will be seen in your life through your humility. And the Spirit of God will be seen in your life through your wisdom. Those three things, he knew how to be a steward. He knew how to steward things. He was wise, he was humble, and he had a godly character. He wasn't one that wanted to brag. He wasn't one that needed to be loud. He, he wasn't one that needed affirmation, an attaboy, a pat on the back, recognition, an award. He, he didn't need any of those things. He didn't need popularity. So because he was faithful with the little, what does God say? I'll make you a steward over more. Notice verse 40, you shall be over my house and all of my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. There will be no one greater than you but myself because of his wise planning and preparation. You're gonna rule over my house. And he surrenders all authority over to the knowledge and wisdom of Joseph. Everything is given over to your hands because of your humility, character, and wisdom. God's spirit is in you. There's no one better for every, everything else to be under the submission of someone else but you, Joseph. And he says this in verse 40. And 41, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. This is the part where most people never make it to. This is the part in, in, in our lives and trials that oftentimes we never see. The exaltation, the promotion that comes from God. M most people never make it to this place because in the process of God preparing them through different trials and tribulations and problems, maybe even injustice, you know what? They become very carnal and angry and resentful at other people. Because they become bitter, they try to vindicate themselves, then God cannot finish what he wanted to do in their lives. And they get off the path of obedience oftentimes by trying to defend themselves or trying to get even. And therefore, God is saying, okay, if you want to defend yourself, then I will let you. <laughs> Would you rather defend yourself or let God defend you? Most of us never see this place because we stop trusting God along the way. I want you to be very careful, even if you go through times of injustice, that you don't make it about yourself, that you don't make it personal. Because the moment that you start making it about yourself and making it personal, you know what happens? You miss out on the blessing. The blessing of staying on the path of God. The preparation, the advancement only comes from the Lord. It never is going to come from yourself vindicating yourself. You will never be satisfied from that. The psalmist says in Psalm 75, and we've read it many times before, for exaltation, it doesn't come from the east, nor the west, nor the south, 
But God is the judge. He puts down one, and what does he do? He's the one that exalts another. God is the one that does these things. Now, promotion and advancement is never enough without the Lord. You can't say that now that I've been promoted, now that I've been advanced, now I don't need the Lord. No, the Lord promotes out of obscurity, but Joseph realizes that he needs the Lord now more than he ever has. He receives the ultimate promotion or advancement. What a picture here of even Christ Jesus who humbled himself in Philippians chapter 2. What did it say? That he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. That's the weight of exaltation. First, become low. And he sets them over all Egypt. Verse 42, then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand that signified authority and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He clothes them with honor, with authority. This is the ultimate from rags to riches story here. He was one that had to receive orders. Now he's responsible to being one that gives orders. And notice he says in verse 43, and he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. He was second in command, and they cried out before him, bow the knee, so he set him over all the land of Egypt. People looked at him with respect because he was responsible as second in command. Why? Because Joseph kept his integrity. Because Joseph waited on the Lord. Because Joseph learned to trust in God. Because he didn't become impatient. God will use even the pain that you have gone through to prepare you for the position he has for you. He will use even the pain that you have gone through to prepare you for the position that he has for you. You notice what we need to do is humble ourselves and stay there humbled before the Lord. In Proverbs 18, 12, this Solomon would say this, before destruction... The heart of a man is Adi. You know what Adi means? Proud, arrogant. When you're proud and arrogant, what, is, what happens? You're setting yourself up for destruction. But before honor is humility. That's what Joseph had in his life. He was humble. And there it says again in verse 44, and Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I'm Pharaoh and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or his foot in all of the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphna Pinea, and he gave him as a wife Asenath, the daughter of Padi Pharaoh, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. He gave him also a wife. He gave him everything, and then he also gave him a wife. I think it's interesting that the Bible, through the Holy Spirit, tells us that he had a wife. You remember his integrity where he did not want to fornicate. He did not want to become entangled with the sin of Potiphar's wife, but later, what did the Lord bless him with? His own wife. And in verse 46, it says, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. Well, what an example there of a young man that was promoted. It was like Daniel. He was a teenager when he was picked to be in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar as a teenager, Daniel. David was anointed to be king before he was 30 years old. By the time he was 30, then he had become king of the, all, the entire nation of Israel. Josiah, in the Bible, was eight years old when he became a king. I don't think anyone should ever say that person is too young to be used by God. Paul told Timothy, let no one despise your youth. I, I want to encourage anyone here, don't think you're either too young or too old to be used by God. It, it tells us his age for a reason. God was maturing him. God was developing him. And he was 30 years old when he was second in command of all of Egypt. And he stood before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and he went throughout the land of Egypt now, in the seven years of plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities and laid up every city, the food of the fields which surrounded them. 
He was faithful. He was hardworking. He was wise. God's Spirit developed him to be responsible. Notice the responsibility there in verse 48. What does wisdom bring? Responsibility. He had gone through the school of God developing. 17 years old, God showed him what he would do. At 30, it came to pass. He had to wait. He had to be trained. And he was the one now inspecting the land there. It would tell us there in verse 47 and 48, and Joseph gathered 49 very much grain at the, as the sand in the sea until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. Such a faithful steward that, that he had stopped counting because there was now so much as the sand in the sea, too much to count. That's how he gathered. That's how he stewarded. That's the kind of man he was. This is what you see in a man that has integrity. Not one that talks a lot. That's not the gifted man. You know the one that is gifted, the one that has integrity? The one that has his house in order. The one that has his things in order. He was responsible. And then it tells us there in verse 50, and Joseph, to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine, came whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him his wife. Joseph called the name of the first Manasseh. Very important that we remember here Manasseh. And the name of the son Manasseh, the significance of this name means, for God has made me forget all the toil and all of my father's house. So look at the word forget. Why does he name his son Manasseh? Because I have forgotten all the pain of the past. God allowed him to forget the troubles and everyone in his father's house that caused them pain. Do you see that Joseph didn't nurse that pain? He didn't keep his pain. He didn't dwell on the pain. He didn't say, I'm a victim of the pain. He didn't stick to the past. You know what he said? I'm forgetting the past. I'm not dwelling on those bad memories. They don't define me. I'm not going to be defeated by them. I'm not going to try to defend myself. He, he forgot about it. He stopped living in the past. He moved on. He let it go. I want you to look at that verse because maybe there are some of you here that need to forget about the pain of the past now. Move on. Let it go. Let God use you. He can't use you if you're still holding on to resentment, to bitterness, to pain, to anger, to wrath. Forget about it. Move on now. And he names his son this way because he says, God has given me the strength to forget about all of that. I'm not living in that. I'm not walking in that. I forgot about that. God freed me from all of that. I'm not living in that. I'm not trying to justify myself from the past. God has helped me forget about my troubles of the past. I moved on. What did Paul say? But one thing I do, I press on. I don't count myself as one that has apprehended. But I'm, I'm reaching forward. One thing I do, I, I forget the things that are behind me so I can reach forward to the things that are ahead. The only way that you reach forward to the things that are ahead is you have to forget what's behind now. He forgot what was behind so that he can move forward. And then it tells us there, Verse 52, and the name of the second son was Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my afflictions. Notice, I forgot about that. Therefore, now I can become fruitful. Even in the land of my affliction, God has made me fruitful in the land where I have experienced pain. Even through pain, God brings fruit. Do you see that? Even in the season of pain, at the end, God brings years of fruit. And I love this about Joseph, what he does here, because even though he had an Egyptian wife, he didn't forget the faith of his fathers. The Lord promoted him. The Lord raised them up. And you know what he did? He still gave his sons Hebrew names. This is amazing. <laughs> he didn't move on regards to his faith. He forgot about everything except his faith. 
And he protected his children. What did he do? He gave them Hebrew names. Names according to the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Jacob, Isaac. This is what you see and what you call as integrity in the life of a man, protecting his children. Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of famine began to come. And as Joseph had said, the famine was in all the lands, but in all the lands of Egypt there was bread. Notice, there was not bread except in the land of Egypt. It became a source of distribution for the rest of the land surrounding them. And here we see in verse 55, so when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread. They were crying and they were hungry. They were famished. Then Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says, you do. Joseph is the type of Christ in the Old Testament for us. If you're famished, if you want bread, you know you can go to the bread of life and do whatever he says. There's so many that, whose souls are famished today. You know what God is saying? Come to Christ and be fed. You're hungry. You're starving because you haven't had bread and it's the bread of life. Go to him and be fed. The famine was over all the face of the earth and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain, because the famine was severe in all the lands. You know what he did? He passed three tests there, Joseph. He passed the test, number one, that with authority, there comes a need of accountability. Nobody ever rises above the level of personal accountability. With authority, there always comes a need of accountability. Joseph was accountable. Joseph was a good steward before the Lord. What else happened there as he was second in command? With popularity comes always the need of humility. He was still humble. He wasn't self-dependent, self-confident. What was he? Depending upon God. And with prosperity always comes the need of integrity. These all are characteristics of Joseph. And what's the lesson at the end of this all? If you're hungry, if your soul is famished, the command is given. You know what the command is given? Go to Jesus and eat of the bread of life. Admit, admit your hunger to him. Admit that you're not satisfied. <laughs> admit that your soul is, is famished. Forsake the drought Forsake the famine of this life, of this world, of this earth. You know what you can say? Lord, I've come to your heavenly storehouse now. I come to be filled because I'm empty. Nothing else satisfies but when you come to the heavenly storehouses of Jesus. Amen? Let's pray.